Hey there, lovely YouTube community. My name is Valentina Castaño. I am a journalist and today I am recording this video out of the need I feel of getting this case out there. I feel like it holds very important research information and it's hard to find much about it in English. So with that being said, let's get started. For today's case, we are going to Colombia. Or maybe I should say coming to Colombia because this is the place where I was born and raised. For those of you who don't know, Colombia is a country located in South America, at the very top of it. It is a beautiful place, full of nice people and incredible landscapes, but as any other country in the world, it also has its issues. And in the 1990s, those issues were big, to say the least. The authorities had their hands pretty full dealing with the drug cartels, the guerrilla and the paramilitary. These armed groups were causing terror among the Colombian people. Kidnappings, bombings and much more trouble situations did not give a break to the crime investigation teams. I blame this as one of the reasons for the lack of concern there was over another growing problem. The problem that we're here to talk about actually. So it happens that in different regions of the country many young boys started to go missing. And when I say many, I don't mean like 10 or 15, I mean more like dozens of them. Something weird was that all of these missing boys had the same characteristics. Most were in between the ages of 10 to 14, most came from rural communities or small towns, most were hardworking and would help supporting their families with little jobs like selling lottery tickets or other stuff in their town main parks or the bus stations. But even though the many cases had a lot of similarities, since they were happening in different states or departments as we call them, each state police were working on their own without realizing this was a nationwide situation. On top of it all, Many cases were getting dismissed as runways and others were not even getting reported since they were happening in such isolated communities that these kids' families would have trouble even getting in touch with the authorities to file the reports. But this lack of concern will slowly, and I mean very stupidly slowly, change into fear when the disappearances turned into murders. It was 1994 when the reports for boys found dead in isolated and densely vegetated areas started to come in from all over the country. The cases covered 12 of the 32 states, Antioquia, Cundinamarca, Boyacá, Caquetá, Meta, Guaviare, Risaralda, Caldas, Quindío, Valle del Cauca, Cauca and Nariño. The bodies would turn up fully naked, covered in knife wounds, and sometimes more than one body was found in the same area. I pause here to remember you guys that this happened in the 90s. This was not 1955 when kids would roam around the fields after a day of hard labor. It amazes me that the media, the community, or somebody was not making more fuss about the situation. Literally, nobody was talking about it. You have no idea how hard it is to find information about it online. Every investigation team was just treating each case by itself and many did not even make it to the local media. But everything changed on November of 1998. This time, a mass grave with boys' remains was found in Nacederos, a community located in the outskirts of Pereira, very close to the airport of that city. Well, that was finally something that seemed harder to ignore. About the way this finding was made, it was said that a man was riding a horse through some woods near a residential area when he saw skulls and bones and he immediately called the police. The authorities arrived on the scene immediately. It was a very difficult access area, you know, they had to make their way through the thick vegetation, but once they got there, they found the skeletal remains of 14 boys. Yeah, 14 boys. The first forensic analysis determined that they were in fact Caucasian boys. In between the ages of 8 to 14, all of them had stab wounds, some of them had what investigators called torture wounds, meaning that there were minor stabs caused only to inflict pain. 
all of the missing children reports finally finally had some importance um, to the authorities to the media to the community and the investigation started there in the state of Risaralda. The detective Aldemar Duran was the one that took on the case from there. But just remember, even though a detective was assigned, he didn't know yet the magnitude of the problem. His investigation was focusing mainly on the state and area where this finding had happened. But way sooner than later, he started to connect dots and had to look beyond that. When Duran and his team started to investigate, they had no clue what this was about. They thought of everything from narco retaliations to witchcraft and Satanism, but none of the pieces of the puzzle was fitting properly. In their minds, the only next possible option to generate new clues was finding out who these kids were, you know, identifying them. But it was not going to be so easy. They couldn't fingerprint them, due to the decomposition state that they were found in. And since the boys all came from humble backgrounds, they haven't had any dentist worked on, which meant they didn't have no dental records to compare. Well, their idea to fix this was calling a morphologist, somebody who could create 3D portraits of the boys using their skulls as a guide. And so they called the best one they could find in the country, the guy's name is Mario Leonard Tuluaga. But this specialist didn't have an easy job. There were no international standards for facial measurements of Hispanic children, and he had to create his own by studying a bunch of alive boys' faces. Well, as you can imagine, this process was going to take some time. So during that time, Duran and his team kept investigating. I think personally, that the fact that this case got to Detective Duran's hands <laughs> really gave everything a positive turn. The guy worked very hard, he was very strict, and with the help of his team, he quickly started finding connections between the Frisaralda mur murders with other missing and murdered children cases around the country. The similarities between the victims and the characteristics of the crimes were the hints that led these people to believe. For the first time in the whole investigation, that these could be the actions of the same person, a serial killer, you know, this could be just one perpetrator. Well, it took them so long to get to that conclusion, they thought of everything before that, but you have to understand that this was the first time something like this happened in the country, you know, it had never happened before, at least not that people n knew of. But if it was only one killer, Duran wanted to get him. He focused on his task to the point where he started to get called by his peers the shadow of the killer. Thumbs up for these guys, everybody. <laughs> One of the few that cared among the apathy of the vast majority, you know. <laughs> Before him, this was not really getting that much investigated. So, the next big clue came with another gruesome finding. This time in Palmira. Department of Valle del Cauca, only 60 kilometers away from Pereira. Pereira, remember where the Nazareros mass grave was found. So this area of the country is well known for their great amount of sugarcane plantations. And I don't know if you know sugarcane, but these things grow high, you know, creating a feeling of cornfields. Perfect for hiding whatever you please. So the 6th of February, 1999, the body of a young boy was found amid these plantations. But this time, many other items were also collected from that crime scene as evidence. And two detectives that were aware and working on the chilling cases of the missing and murdered boys in this same area of the sugarcane plantations, they realized that this was important evidence and they took on the lead. So what was found? It was a total of 13 items, a lighter, prescription glasses, shoes, a bottle of alcohol, money, underwear. The detectives knew that for the suspect to have left all of this behind meant that he had to be running away from something. And they wanted to find out what he was running away from. Well, soon they did. 
These sugarcane crops are burned after harvesting to make space for new crops. So while this sick predator was killing his victims, the farmers happened to begin the crop burning. And so the guy had to escape from the flames. This was another great lead that told investigators that the suspect must have burned himself while trying to get out of the plantation. Well, the items also had a whole story to tell. The prescription glasses located the suspect as a male in the age of 14 to 55, uh, according to the eye condition that he was suffering from. The guy rotated one of his feet as he walked in some kind of like weird limp and they could tell that from the way his shoes were worn out. Also from the shoe size they compared charts and determined that the guy's height was around 163 centimeters. That's like 5 foot 4 around that. Uh, the 27 bills they found made a total of 179,000 pesos, which today is close to $45. Back in those days it was a little bit more. But using those, they could also determine that the guide moved easily around the country. These had been distributed in the city of Ipiales, located in the border between Ecuador and Colombia, quite far away from Palmira, where they had been found. On top of it all, the fluids collected from the alcohol bottle were stored for future comparisons with the suspects. I have to tell you that these alcohol bottles were also found in other crime scenes previously and it was always the same brand of alcohol. It is called Aperitivo de la Carta and it's like a local booze, the cheapest one back then and the cheapest one still. I don't even know if they sell that anymore. But well, let's keep on going. The analysis was clear. They were looking for a man in his 40s or 50s that limped, had glasses and that used to drink the same type of liquor always. But who was he? To this point, this had already turned into a nationwide investigation. There were no longer any doubts that all of these murders were committed by one man only. The detectives pulled out the files from child abuse cases that had taken place within the last 10 years and out of those 5,225 cases or case files, they dismissed the ones in which the victim was a girl, as well as the ones in which the aggressor didn't fit the age group or any other of the profile characteristics. And this left the detectives with no more than 25 names. Meanwhile, Detective Duran kept working in silence. Uh, he knew he needed to find more evidence and so he flew to Bogota, capital city of Colombia. He thought that if he was to find more clues, that was the proper place to look for them. And after days of reviewing case files, he came across one that caught his attention. It had happened in Tunja, a city located 205 kilometers away from Bogota. The document told the story of the disappearance and homicide of 12-year-old Ronald Delgado. Ronald's body had been found in a desert area covered in weeds and grass, and the characteristics of his murder were remarkably similar to the ones of the other boys Detective Duran had been investigating. According to the document, the owner of a small shop and some prostitutes that worked in the area where the boy had gone missing, stated that they saw the boy along a man that was not from around town. This man had been stopped and questioned by the police, but he had to be released due to the lack of evidence against him. His name was Luis Alfredo Garavito Cubichos, a man that happened to be in the list of the 25 suspects. While Duran kept reviewing this file, he saw two very important details in, in Garavito's story. So his ID said that he was from Genova, Quindío, the town where the three cases that Duran had started to investigate at the beginning took place in 1993. And also the address that Garavito had wrote down at his residence was in Trujillo, a town where other murders had too been committed. So Duran tracked his last address, of course, and there he found the suspect's family in a very rural area where most of the population were farmers. The detective had an interview with one of Garavito's sisters, Esther Garavito Cubillos, 
When he asked her if Garavito had left anything behind, she handed him a bag full of personal items that Garavito had specifically asked everybody not to touch. So the contents of that bag reveal more about the suspect than what Duran could have ever phantom. There were documents, tickets, photos, diaries, books, like everything with dates, you know, very trackable. In there, Duran also found information of another ongoing investigation. This case had Garavito as the prime suspect of a murder of a boy committed in the community of Corinto, Valle del Cauca. Something that he didn't even have a clue about, you know, like a murder that he hadn't even having his list of investigation, like nothing. And this guy had like some like cuts and stuff, you know, from newspapers about this investigation. So, yeah, very convenient. So just realize how difficult it was to get everyone in the same investigation center around the country, you know. There wasn't that much communication but back then, things were just very different. But after this, Duran had no doubt that he had the man. This was his man. Garavito was his man. The only problem was that how was he going to find him, you know? He had no clue where he was hiding. So Duran traced back another address that, I mean, found among all these papers and stuff, you know, like it was from like a, a deposit made to some lady and he tracked this. And with that, they got to the house of Graciela Zabaleta, or Chela, as Garavito used to call her. For several years, she had lived with him and her son Rodolfo in a semi-family environment. And I say semi because it was never fully functional. Some sources report that the couple was never intimate and they were more like really close friends than anything else. Anyway, at Graciela's house, the investigators found yet another big bag full of personal items that Garavito had asked her to store for him while he was away. Again, Newspapers, lottery tickets, bus tickets, photos, books, about alternative medicine, about astrology, about Satanism, and more. Along with fibers, razor blades, knives, and loops. Same elements commonly found along the crime scenes, you know. Like I said, they already knew they had their men. And on top of it all, Graciela disclosed that the reason why things had ended between her and Garavito was the fact that he had a drinking problem. Man, guess what liquor he liked to drink? Exactly, aperitivo de la carta, same liquor found in all of the crime scenes. So by this point, Aldemar Duran, the detective, was 100% certain that he had the guy. But where was he still? He couldn't find him. You know, this guy moved all around the country very easily all the time in a time in which tracking was not that easy. But now let's move on to the story that finishes this whole mess. It was the 22nd of April 1999. The day was just starting in the Centauros Park of Villavicencio, a city located in the east of Colombia, a state of Meta. John Ivan Zabogal, an 11-year-old boy, was expecting to sell some lottery tickets. He did this in order to help his family pay for his school expenses and other stuff. But that day, Ivan didn't return home as his, at the usual time. So his mom, Maria, decided to report this quickly to the authorities. Honestly, I wonder a lot about this. The mom reported this so soon. Maybe she already knew about the other missing boys' cases, you know, maybe she was already aware of this and was panicky, I don't know why. Really, it was immediate, you know. This is, this is just something that I go through a lot because it just surprises me how quickly this could get reported and how quickly they start looking for him. So, there in Villavicencio, another detective, Fernando Aja, was the one that was assigned to the case and he quickly started to look for the boy. He was aware of the danger <laughs> that the other missing boys represented, so they, all the patrols set on the roads, you know, started looking for the kid. Aja had already been investigated the murder of 13 boys found in the outskirts of the city, so the guy was pretty worried about this 
other missing boy. They were looking all over the city, they couldn't find him, there was no clue of where Johnny Wan was, until, well, it was already getting dark when the police got a phone call from a lady saying that a young boy and a homeless man were at her house claiming that the boy had been attacked by another man, you know, that they were running away from a man that had attacked this boy and uh, they had asked her to call the authorities, so that's why she was phoning the police. And they quickly arrived there to find Ivan scared and disheveled but alive to his mom's like joy, you know, she was so joyful to see him good. Ivan started telling a story, a crazy story, about a guy that had told him that he needed to help him with some sick cows that he had and to please go with him, that he would pay him some money while he was selling his lottery tickets at the park. And so Ivan, you know, a little boy, craving money, craving to help his family, he decided to go with this man. And turns out this guy took him to the fields and he had started to like uh, made sexual approaches and of course John Ivan was screaming, the little boy was scared and this homeless man happened to be walking around by by pure luck, this homeless man was walking around, he heard Johnny Van, he started throwing rocks at this man, so Johnny Van, as this guy got scared, Johnny Van could run, and he started running with the homeless man, but at the beginning the abusers started chasing them. It wasn't until he realized that he couldn't keep up with their pace that he stopped and went to hide again in the fields. And that's when the boy and the homeless man could go to the lady's house and phone the police. So. The police started looking for this man all over, like, this criminal, where could he be? Uh, all the patrols were again on the roads, this time not looking for Ivan, but looking for the suspect. Some taxi drivers were also helping in the look, you know, some people that were already aware of the story were also helping on the look, so the police got a phone call from one of these taxi drivers and they told, he told them, like, oh, I'm seeing this guy coming out of the woods. Um, he looks like disheveled, he looks messy, sketchy, and the police went to apprehend him. Uh, they asked his name and the guy gave a name, Bonifacio Moreira Liscano. The police had never heard his name before, but they apprehended the guy and they asked Johnny Juan, is this the guy that was doing this stuff to you? And he said like, yeah, that's the guy, that's him. So they apprehended him, they took him to the station and they called other investigation teams because they were already aware of the investigation that was being that was taking place all over the country so they called Duran and they were like oh we have a guy here we think this is your man can you come over to identify him so as Duran traveled to Villavicencio from Pereira where he was from Rizaralda to Meta these people were, I mean, the authority there was questioning the suspect, you know, like, hey, give us your real name, we know that's not your name, we can find you anywhere in, in like, the, you're not registered, uh, please, please, what, what have you done, what were you doing, we know you were abusing this boy, but this guy was quiet, he wasn't giving one answer, and that was until Aldemar Duran arrived. And he asked to confront the guy, you know, he asked if he could interview him. And they absolutely let him go in there. He... Could you imagine, could you sit back and imagine like the joy this guy felt finally after all these years in the look? He finally was sitting right there in front of the man that had been murdering, torturing, and God knows what else doing to these children, you know. And what Duran did was that he started confronting him with the evidence, like, I know this is you, I know who you are, I know where you live, I know where you've been and what you've done. And there is no way for you to hide this any longer. And so finally, the guy confessed. He said, yes, I am Luis Alfredo Garavito Cubillos, I am sorry for my crimes, I've done all of this that you're accusing me of and much more but this is where we're going to cut this video because the part two is going to be the story of Garavito himself you know like this criminal and and we're going to dig deeper into his past why he did what he did and where is he now 
and so yeah thanks for sticking with me through this video and i hope you liked it and stay tuned for part two bye